And I wanted to thank you for this new Sunday. Lord, I want to thank you for all of the people that are here this morning. And Father, as we look at this first Sunday of the new year, it is my prayer that each of us today might clearly understand our purpose. Sometimes, Father, we have an emptiness in our life. And that emptiness is simply because we're not a Christian. But there are many Christians who are empty as well. They've never found their purpose. And I would pray, Father, that today, in the simplicity of this message, that, Father, we might leave here today fully understanding our purpose. Lord, I do believe that sometime this year, our church will be debt-free. And I want to thank you, Father, in advance for that. But, Father, as we think of our church becoming debt-free, and as we think of the church going into a new transitional phase from being indebted to debt-free, Father, we must, as Christians, ask ourselves what is your will for our church and when we open the pages of the Bible we will clearly learn this morning our purpose as individuals and as Christians so Father we're getting ready now to open our Bibles and as we prepare to open our Bibles I'm just going to ask you if you would to open our hearts up in our minds to receive the clear teaching of your word. All of this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue our series, Love Letters from the Groom to the Bride. And the title of today's message is Between You and God. Our text is going to be John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. So you can feel free to turn there. But before we turn there, before I turn there, I wanted to remind you why we entitled our series, Love Letters from the Groom to the Bride. The Bible teaches us that one day there's going to be a great wedding ceremony in heaven. The Bible says in Revelation 19.7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So one day, all of us who are Christians, that is, somebody who realizes that they are a sinner and they need a Savior. At some point in their life, your life, my life, the Holy Spirit said to you, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then the Bible said, But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then the Bible said, As many as received him, to them he gives the authority to become a child of God. And then the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I came in. And so that's what it means to be a Christian. We have to be the bride of Christ. So I would challenge you this morning, make sure that you're a Christian. But now the verse goes on to say in Revelation 19.8, Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So what the Bible says is that one day there's going to be a great wedding in heaven. And all of us who are Christians will be there. At that point, the wedding ceremony between the groom, Jesus, and the bride, the church, takes place. And the bride is wearing what the Bible says are the righteous acts of the saints. So our wedding garment is adorned, if you will, in the righteous acts of the saints. And that means that you and I have to do the righteous acts of the saints. You remember Jesus said in John 14, 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. Today, when we head back into the Gospel of John, we will see Jesus telling his disciples about the righteous acts. And so if you have your Bible, we're in John chapter 15, verse 1, 
And let me remind you where we left off. We left off in John chapter 14, verse 31, and here's what the Bible says. Come now, let us leave. Jesus had washed the disciples' feet. They had had the Last Supper, and he taught them about the Holy Spirit. And then he said, come on, let's go. So Jesus and the eleven disciples either left the upper room and went to another room, or, they left the upper room and they began their walk to Calvary. If they began their walk to Calvary across Jerusalem, let me remind you that it's Passover and so it's a full moon. And as they're walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, the full moon above them, they would have seen all over Jerusalem great bonds. And so Jesus now teaches his remaining 11 disciples about the vine. Now, I do want to say to you that between now and our Good Friday Lord's Supper, counting today, are 15 Sundays. So, starting today, we are going to invest our time in John 15, 16, and 17. And then on Friday, April 14th, by candlelight, we will talk about the crucifixion. And then we will celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So for the next 15 Sundays, including this one, we are going to walk with Jesus, with his disciples, on his way to Calvary, under the full moon of the Passover sky, as they take step by step, by step, to the Garden of Gethsemane. What does Jesus say as they leave the upper room? I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. So Jesus says that there is a caregiver, and the caregiver is going to take care of this true vine. So what does it mean, the true vine? If you were to take your Bibles, and you don't need to, but if you did take your Bibles, and you went back to the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, here's what you would read. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and he cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Now listen carefully. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, what did it yield? Only bad. And then verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. He looked for justice, but he found bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, and he heard cries of distress. Or you can look at Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and you took, and you took root and filled the land. So the Bible says that in the Old Testament, Israel is the vine of God. But when God looked at the vine, all it produced was bad fruit. Now, I'm going to tell you, we want to plant two great vines in the prayer garden. We're going to have a living illustration of the vine. So one of you, I know, wants to buy two great vines and plant them. So tear off that FOI and put it in a full offering plate and say, Pastor, I'll buy those two and plant them. And if more of you do it, then you can find out in church if one does it. We're going to have a living illustration of the vine. But now Jesus says, but now I am the true vine. So Jesus is now replacing Israel as the true vine. And he says, my father is the gardener. 
where the King James Version says husbandman. It's the Greek noun georgos, ye meaning earth or land, and ergon work. So the farmer, the vine dresser, the husbandman, is a worker of the earth. And so what Jesus is saying now, I'm the vine. My father is the caregiver. Now let's see how the father cares for you and me as the branches. Look at verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. Now, if you have the King James Version of the Bible, your Bible says he takes away every branch that doesn't bear fruit. That is the Greek verb ero, which literally means to lift up. So there's really two possible schools of thought. Some people believe that the caregiver, the father, looks at the vine, looks at the branch that's not bearing fruit, and he snips off that which isn't bearing fruit. That's one possibility. But the Greek verb arrow literally means to lift up. Now, if you were to come to my home, and you're certainly welcome to do that, and you went to the side of our house, we have a rose bush, and it's a vining rose bush. So do you know what we do? We get pieces of string, and what do we do? We reach down and we lift up that branch and tie it up. If you go to a vineyard, what do they do with the branches that are on the ground? They lift them up and tie them. So I'm leaning towards lifting up. The caregiver gives care by doing this. He cuts off or he lifts up every branch in me that bears no fruit. He lifts it up. When you became a Christian, didn't God the Father lift you up? He raised you up from death to life. He placed you in the body of Christ. He teaches you the Bible. He provides you the Holy Spirit. You have the fellowship of the saints. You are lifted up. But now the caregiver does something else. The Bible says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, He proves. And he does so, it will be more fruitful. Now the word prune, or purges in the King James Version, is the Greek verb kephero, from which we get catharsis. What does that mean? Well, you know what it means. It means to clean. So what does the caregiver do? He wants you to bear fruit. He wants me to bear fruit. So what he does is he lifts us up, but... He also cleanses us. He takes those things in our life that are detracting from Him, and He gets rid of them. If you have rose bushes like us, you spray them for bugs, right? You want to get rid of those bugs. You want it to be clean. So the Father in heaven is the caregiver. He gives care. He cuts off or He lifts off. He prunes, he purges, he cleans, all for the purpose, <coughs> excuse me, so that you will be even more fruitful. Look at verse 8. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, you should be my disciples. So this is very simple. What is the purpose of the branch? The purpose of the branch is to bear fruit, not to produce the fruit, but to bear the fruit. Now you should underline that, put asterisks or something by it, because this is your purpose, my purpose, as a child of God. The purpose is that we will bear fruit. Now, don't forget, when well, I need something to buy, two great minds. Now, there's a prerequisite to bearing fruit. Look at verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
Now, the King James Version uses the word abide. Whether it's remain or abide, it's the Greek verb meno, <coughs> excuse me, which simply means to be at home. Do you remember when Mary found out she was pregnant? She went and she visited with Elizabeth for three months and she remained, abode, or stayed in the home of Elizabeth. Remember Jesus saw this uh, tax collector up in a sycamore tree called Zacchaeus. He said, Zacchaeus, come on down because today I need to abide, remain in your home. So the prerequisite for you and for me bearing fruit is that we are at home in Jesus. We remain in Jesus. Now that's a challenge for some of us, isn't it? Because some of us deeply, deeply love the world out there. And we're more at home in the world than we are in God's house. But if you want to remain in Jesus, abide in Jesus, Home with you. I am the vine, you are the branch. If a man remains, abides in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do that. Now that's pretty clear, isn't it? It's very clear. Here's my promise to you. If you remain in me, you're going to bear fruit. That's exactly what he said. So we have to look at our life, and we ask ourselves, am I bearing, not producing, am I bearing fruit? And if I am, good. And if I'm not, why not? Am I not a Or maybe I'm not a child of God. Now he talks about a peril in verse 6. Look at it. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Well, there's the panel, isn't it? And I might say to you, this is, to me, what frightens me the most about me. I am always terrified. <coughs> Excuse me that there would come a time in my life where God would say to me, look, Bill, you're done. You're done. You're finished. And I would be set aside. That frightens me. This verse causes some consternation to some folks. But Son of man, how is the wood of a vine better than that of a branch on any of the trees in the forest? Is wood ever taken from it to make anything useful? Do they make pegs from it to hang things on? And after it is thrown on the fire as fuel, and the fire burns both ends and chars the middle, is it then useful for anything? In other words, the wood of a grapevine isn't good for anything except to bear fruit. You can't make furniture out of it. It's too soft. <coughs> Ezekiel says you can't even make a peg out of it to put on your wall to hang your hat on. It is a useless piece of wood except to bear fruit. He says that's not even good for burning. It's such a soft wood that when you start to burn it, it burns up instantly, and it provides no fuel. So when Jesus said to be cast out and burned, he's simply saying, you become useless to me. And isn't that a frightening thought to you? Well, it's a frightening thought to me that God the Father would say, you're done, you're useless. And then there's one last, in verse 7, and I thought that this is something that you would really, really, really think about today. Because it says, if you remain in me, <coughs> And my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. If you could have one thing in 2017, just one. You love to be a Christian who believes prayer with God. 
Well, the Bible tells us how to be a Christian that prevails in prayer. It's so simple. We don't need a book. We don't need ten steps. It's so simple. Here it is. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Jesus says, look, if you stay connected to me, the branch to the vine, if you're at home in me, and I am at home in you, and my words are at home in you, you know what? Your mindset is going to be a mindset that knows exactly the will of God. And what you will be doing is you will be praying God's will back to Him. And the Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. You know, as we get ready to leave this morning, <coughs> excuse me, my goal today was to say this to you. There is the bond. And that is Jesus. And there is the garden, the caregiver, God the Father. And God the Father, the caregiver, is going to care for you and for me in order that we do one thing. And that is very simple. Bear fruit. Not produce it, but bear it. And I would like to remind you that one day all of us will stand before God. And when we stand before God, it's not going to matter if your wife says, man, you're really bearing fruit. It's not going to matter if your husband is saying that, your parents are saying that, or your children are saying that. This is between you and God. And I'm asking you, Look back at last year. Did you bear fruit? Because that is what God wants for you, and that's what He wants for me. Let's make a few connections before we leave this morning. Number one, would you say that you are a healthy brain? He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be more fruitful. Are you a healthy branch? Secondly, are you abiding, remaining? Are you at home in Jesus? Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Are you abiding, remaining? Are you at home in Jesus? I love the contrast between Philippians 1.21 and 2.21. Philippians 1.21 says this, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Philippians 2.21 says, For everyone looks out for his own interests not those of Jesus Christ. Isn't it a fact that Warren Wiersbe is 100% correct that as believers in Jesus Christ, as branches, we either have Jesus as our Lord and we're living for Him, or Jesus is not our Lord and we're living for ourselves. Are you living in Philippians 1.21 or 2.21? That will tell you that you're abiding in the Lord. And then my third question to you is, are you going through a difficult time in your life? And if you're going through a difficult time, is it that God is pruning you, or is it that He is punishing you? And the Bible tells us, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 6, because the Lord disciplines those He loves, and He punishes everyone He accepts as a son. Some of us, have moved outside of God's will for our life. And so he's punishing us, as Hebrews 12, 6 said. But others of us might be going through a hard time. And it's not that we've sinned, it's just simply that God is pruning us, purging us, cleansing us, cutting off those things that are keeping us from being all that we can be for his glory to bring fruit. 
I would ask you if you are clean based upon the Word of God. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse 3, you are already clean because of the Word I have spoken to you. You might be cleaner than me, and I might be cleaner than you, but that's not the issue. The issue is, are you clean based upon the truth, the principles of God's Word? And then I would ask you this. Do you in 2017 want to be a Christian that prevails in prayer? If you do, it is just so simple. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. You don't have to go to Lifeway and get a study on how to be effective in prayer. You don't have to go online and get a study on how to pray effectively. It's right here in one verse. Be at home in Jesus, and Jesus is in the home in you, and you're going to be pray God's thoughts back to me. But now I would ask you this. If you're today not abiding, do you know when you stop? Chances are you do. You see, the Bible says in verse 5, I am the true vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I am in him, he will bear fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. <coughs> if you're not abiding in Jesus, where did you separate from him? Where did you come apart? Because this adverb simply means to separate, to be apart. Every one of us here, if we are not abiding in Jesus, we know, we know exactly where it is that we step aside from Jesus, don't we? Just take a yes, to do that. We all know if we have separated ourselves and where. And aren't you glad that the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today, you can decide to once again be abiding in Jesus. The last question, the last connection point is this. Is your life glorifying to God? You say, well, how do I know that? Well, he told us, didn't he? This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, it's always interesting to me because you can pull out these books off the shelves and this commentator will say that and this commentator will say this. A pastor will say this and somebody else will say that. But you know, I like going by God's definitions because I'm going to stand before God and He's the one that's going to judge me. So while we can debate if we're glorifying God or not, God says this. You glorify me when you bear much fruit. So that would be the question. Are we bearing much fruit? Our choices today are really quite simple. Where will you spend your eternal days? Jesus said in John 1, 12, As many as received me, to them I gave the authority to become a child of God. You might be looking back at your life and thinking, you know, I'm not bearing fruit. I'm not fulfilling my purpose. Maybe I'm not a Christian. Wouldn't this be the day to settle that? But you say, I am a Christian. Great. How are you going to live your earthly days? This is the first day of 2017. The rest of this year, would you like to be happy? Non-rhetorical question. Would you like to be happy? Yes, you want to be happy. I don't think any of you said, oh, boy, well, this is an awful year. You want to be happy. Jesus told us how to be happy in John 13, 17, didn't he? Now that you know these things, happy are you if you do them. He tells us not to be happy. Would you like peace? <coughs> I'd like to get rid of this. John 14, 27. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Just think. He's told us how to be happy. He's told us how to have peace. And now today, He's told us how to fulfill our purpose. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Now, what's left? All that's left is for you and for me to make a decision. If you're not a Christian, will you be one? And will you do it today? And if you are a Christian, 
How are you going to live the rest of your earthly days? You want to be happy? You want peace? You want purpose? Jesus defines it for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you so much for this very, very, very simple and practical passage of Scripture. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus and those disciples left the upper room and under the full moon of the Passover sky, as they began their journey to the Garden of Gethsemane and then on to Calvary, Jesus points out the vine. And he said, I am the vine, but you are the branches. Oh, God, what a clear teaching that is for all of us here today. It's my prayer for somebody here who's not a Christian that they will come today and know Christ. My prayer is if there's a Christian who is struggling, that they might make an altar right where they're at. And say, oh, God, I want to be happy. God, I want peace. God, I want to fulfill my purpose. God, if you'll help me, I'll surrender to you. What a great day this is in the house of the Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this day. I pray your blessings upon us. Now draw us to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Come just as you are. The altar's open. You feel free to come.